Well, we're glad that you're here, and I'm praying that this year, 2021, will be a year of genuine worship, a year of genuine worship, when we worship the true one in 2021. Well, you know, often church is about convenience, not conviction. Often it's about being seen rather than coming to see it's often about me feeling better about myself rather than trying to feel the heart of God. It's often about being religious without being righteous. It's often about being entertained without offering my heart of worship to the King. That's why I'd like to think this year here at First Baptist Church that 2021 is a year when we offer genuine, true worship to God. Because it's in that worship expression, as we worship him, that he comes into our midst and he displays his presence among us. And after all, the presence of God is what we want. Because, as the patriarch said, Lord, if your presence goes not with us, we shall not move from this point. And I believe with all of my heart that if God goes with us, 2021 is going to be a lot better than 2020. And some people say, well, you don't have to do much to get better than 2020. I understand. It's been a, it's been a challenging year for ministries, churches, all over the place. Because the enemy knows that any time he can separate people, God's people, from each other, isolate us, separate us, keep us down from coming together and doing the things that God has called us to do. Anytime he can kind of keep that from happening, he knows that he is slowing down the advancement of the kingdom of God. And this past year was a fight to get the kingdom of God moving forward. But even in the midst of all of that, God was at work. And we saw God do some amazing things this past year. So with all that we had to push through in 2020, listen, this year in 2021, we're going to believe that it's going to be a better, stronger year for the kingdom. And so that's why I wanted to emphasize worship, because anytime you get into the heart of worship, you get into the heart of God. And that's where we want to be. And so today, I am preaching in the first Sunday of every year. I always preach this sermon. I call it the Rock Sermon. We have a lot of different titles for the sermon. But we pass out a stone, a rock. If you did not get your stone yet, I have some people who are going to come around and pass one out to you. I have mine here in my pocket. And if you don't have one, I'd like for you to have it because it's going to be very uh, fundamental to the message this morning. So if you don't have one, raise your hand. And, uh, okay, got one down here on the front row. Just hold your hand up long enough, and one of our men will come by and get you a stone. So today I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 4, Joshua chapter 4. And the title of my message is, It's a Time for New Beginnings. A time for new beginnings. Well, this is a time for new beginnings for a church year, for each of us here at First Baptist in this community. And we want it to be a great, great new year. And so if you'll bear with me, I'm going to give you a little background without reading the entire fourth chapter. Actually, chapter 3 and 4 all go together, but I don't want to read all of those verses. So I'm just going to give you somewhat of the backstory on what we're talking about this morning. Israel has gone through a lot. They've gone through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, a people who had come out of Egypt with a mighty display of God's power, the parting of the Red Sea. It would be a story that would last all through the history of a nation. Israel would never forget, and they would tell that story over and over again of how God rescued his people from Pharaoh's armies out of Egypt and brought them to the Red Sea, 
and delivered them through that by the parting of the Red Sea so that they could escape. And then miraculous, uh, miracles upon miracles, as Pharaoh's army entered the Red Sea, the sea came back together and that army was destroyed, never to bother Israel again. Now, we know that in that 40 years, there were some failures, and there were some faith flaws, and as a result of those faith failures, there was a time where they were not prepared to enter into what God had for them. And so they wandered 40 years because their faith was not ready to embrace God. And until their faith was ready to embrace God, God and his promises and to believe God and step out on them, they could not receive what God had promised. Let me ask you this. Is your life in a position where you are able to receive everything that God wants to give you? You that are watching live stream by home, TV, Facebook, or web, or maybe through our church app, I'm asking everyone in here, myself included. You see, the children of Israel could not receive because they were not in a place to be able to receive. The problem wasn't with God's desire to give. The problem was with their ability to receive. Because the Bible says, and you've heard me say this dozens of times, without faith it's impossible to please God. And they did not have the faith to believe they could be conquerors. They did not have faith to believe they could be victorious. They saw themselves as victims. They could not stand on the promises of God because they were too circumstantially oriented. They could only see their current situation they could not see what they could not see and as a result they lost an opportunity now 40 years later that generation has died off a new generation has come on and they have been taught and trained they have been discipled if you please They have been told the stories of God and now it's time for them to have their own stories. It's time for them to have their own personal relationship with God. You know, folks, it's one thing to hear the stories of faith from God of the past and what God has done for others. But it's more important that you have a story of what God has done for you that it is personal to you. You cannot live off the victories of someone else. You have to have your own personal times with God where God was God to you. And so we come to this point now, and as they are coming to this time of moving forward, it's like there's one last hurdle. Have you ever noticed that the enemy is always throwing one thing after another at you? He's trying to stop you one way or another. He never quits. He never gives up. And so they come to the border of the land that God had promised them, that God had promised Abraham many, many years before. And the Jordan is the border. But the Jordan River now is at flood stage. It's flood stage. How are we going to cross? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a page out of our past. Because what God did at the Red Sea, well, this is just the Jordan. What God did in the past, God is still able to do in the present. Now, this is an important truth, folks. Sometimes we get to thinking that the stories of what God did in the Bible were for then, but they are not for today. Folks, we are robbing ourselves of seeing the moves of God in mighty ways because we tend to relegate the stories 
of what God did in the past to the past. And until you can see that God never changes, the God of yesterday is the God of today and he'll be the God of tomorrow. And if you cannot see that what God did then that God can do today, then you're seeing a different God. The God of the Bible is the same. And he asked this question, is there anything too hard for me? Now, I would like to ask us the same question. Is there anything too hard for our God in 2021? Anything too difficult? Anything too hard for God to do? So as they come upon the Jordan River and it's in flood stage, God had already anticipated this and has already given Joshua, the new leader after Moses, he has already told him exactly how to handle this situation. Now here's the thing I want you to get out of this. That before you get to your flooded Jordan, before you get to your problem, before you get to your impossible situation, remember this, God already has the answer to your problem. You need to understand that it doesn't catch God by surprise. So when you're up against it, you need to remind yourself, God saw this and God has a plan. God has a plan. And God revealed his plan. He revealed it to Joshua and he says, Joshua, tell the people, here's how this is going to work. Tonight, you are to devote yourself cleanse and consecrate yourself you are to ready yourself because tomorrow i will do miracles among you now this is a truth we need to get a hold of you see god said i'm going to do miracles tomorrow but you need to prepare yourself for what I'm going to do tomorrow. You see, a lot of people, they don't devote themselves to God, but they want God to do a miracle. They don't dedicate themselves to the Lord, but when they're up against it, they want God to do the miracle. In other words, I'm not going to pay a price, but I want God to come through. I'm not willing to yield myself and ask God to cleanse me so that he can work a miracle through me. I just want God to do the miracle. I just want to be left alone. And so God says, now tell all the people. Now we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. Send messengers throughout the camp saying, devote yourselves tonight. Purify yourself. Sanctify yourselves tonight because tomorrow I'm going to do miracles among you. I wonder if we as a congregation would really get serious about worship in 2021, would really get serious about devoting ourselves to God in 2021. We would really get serious about our relationship with God in 2021, devoting ourselves to Him. I wonder if we would do that whether we too would be able to see the miracles of God. Do you think? Is it possible? You see, I find Christians all over the place who cannot accept that miracles are for today. Listen, if you can accept the first five words of Genesis 1, you should not have a problem with miracles for today. In the beginning, God created. If you can accept that as truth, then you should not have a problem with the God of creation stepping into our todays and doing miracles for us. You see, faith opens that door. And so here we are that we come to this time. 
Now, it's an interesting thing that when we come to this day, Joshua chapter 4, verse 19 says, the people came out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they encamped at Gilgal on the border of Jericho. Now here's what this means. God said, tomorrow I'm going to do miracles. Tomorrow you're going to cross into a new land. Tomorrow you're going to have a new beginning. Things are going to change tomorrow. Now I want you to understand something, and you need to understand this very importantly, because your situation, whatever you're facing right now, it can all change in 24 hours. God can change destinies in a moment, in a very fast moment. You see, tomorrow, for the children of Israel, it was going to be a whole new beginning and a whole new place and a whole new lifestyle. It was going to be something awesome, and it would start off with a miracle. You see, God had said, take the priest who had been sanctified, those who have prepared their lives, and those who had been appointed by God for this service, have them take the Ark of the Covenant, have them come and stand at the shore of the flooded Jordan, and have them stand there. Because when they stand there and all the people are ready, I am going to dam up the Jordan River all the way back to the city of Adam. We say Adam. It means earth. In other words, the earthly was going to give way to the heavenly. You see, sin flows all the way from Adam to us today. But there was the power of God in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who went to the cross, gave his life, and the flow of condemnation stopped. The flow that had come from Adam's fall stopped at the cross so that you and I are able to cross into a new life. Christ did that for us. The flow of death was stopped at the cross. And so the flow stopped and then Joshua says, everyone, go. Go across. While the waters are stopped, walk across. And the people, the Bible says, they made haste. They, they went across quickly. Listen, when God opens a door, don't hesitate. Don't stop. Don't just talk yourself out of it. Just go, for God is doing something. And they went. And as they crossed over, God said, there's one other thing I want you to do. I want you to pick 12 men, each from the 12 tribes, and I want you to have each one of those men in the place where the priests are standing. You see, because when the waters parted back, the priests carried the ark to the middle of the Jordan, right in the middle of it, and they stopped there. They stopped until everybody could get across. And where they stopped, God said, from around their feet, pick a stone. Have each of the 12 men pick a stone, throw it on his shoulder. So you know it had to be a big stone. It wasn't this size stone. I mean, I'd have a hard time putting that on my shoulder. But the thing of it was, he said, get one, put it on your shoulder, carry it and carry it over to the other side, to the other side, the promised land side, and set it down, all 12 of them, and build a little monument. And that monument will always be a reminder to you, to your children, and to your children's children of the faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God who cannot and will not lie. And so, these men, out of this 
impossible situation, the middle of the Jordan that was at flood stage, now that impossible situation has been rolled back. They take a stone out of there, put it on their shoulder, and they go and they make it into a memorial of the power of God. And this is an amazing thing. And now Joshua does something personally. He goes there too. These 12 men have carried the 12 stones on the other side. Joshua now, in the Jordan, he picks up 12 stones. And he builds a memorial in the middle of the Jordan. While it is dry, he makes a personal memorial for himself right there in the middle of the Jordan. And the Bible says it is still there to this day. Why? Because Joshua was saying, I am not the slave that left Egypt. I am a free man this day. I have left the old wilderness. I have left the life of slavery. I am now a free man in a free land with a new future. This is my memorial. You see, it's kind of like a baptism. A baptism is an act of identification. And when they crossed through the Jordan, all those people, they were identifying with God and God's man and the promises of God. Joshua was identifying with the promises of God. When, you get, when the people crossed through the Red Sea, they were identifying with Moses and God's promises to Moses. And when you and I get baptized today, we are identifying with Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection and the new life he gives to us. So baptism has always been an act of identification. Even for John the Baptist's disciples, it was an act of identification as they identified with John the Baptist and his message of repentance and preparing the way for the coming Messiah. They were identifying with his message. So now we come to this point where everybody's across, the stones are in place. Out of this impossible situation, these stones were taken. And now that which was impossible, they couldn't have gotten those stones before, but that which was impossible now not only becomes possible by the power of God, it becomes a memorial of the faithfulness of God. And so they have set those up. You see, why was this important on this particular day? Well, as I read to you a moment ago in Joshua 4.19, it says they came out of the Jordan. They crossed over. On what day? The 10th day of the first month. And somebody says, okay, 10th day, first month, so what? Well, I want to tell you that's a big so what. Because God said when they were in the wilderness, right after they came out of Egypt, at Kadesh Barnea, where they failed, had a major faith failure, where they rejected God's promise, they rejected God's word, and they listened to their fears, God said, 40 years you will wander in this wilderness. Did you know that the day they crossed into the new land, was exactly to the day, 40 years. You see, God operates by precision and design, not haphazardly, not capriciously, but deliberately. And so the point was that God had a day in which he would deliver his people. How many of you believe that on heaven's calendar, God has a day where he will deliver us? 
Jesus said, I will come again. Folks, I want you to know that's not just any random day. It's not a day when God wakes up and says, hey, today would be a good day to send Jesus back. Why? Oh, I just feel like it. Boop. No, no. Everything, and I mean everything, that's happening in our world, on whatever level you want to talk about, it is all following a divine strategy and a plan that is moving to the day when his son returns. Maybe I ought to stop and ask the question, do you believe he's coming back? You know, some people, when it comes to things like the return of the Lord, the rapture, when it comes to things like miracles and deliverance and the power of God, some people just kind of, eh, no, 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 no. You see, we get comfortable with our designer religion and our designer faith that fits in with what we believe. And it's God who is pulling us to step up to the next level of faith and say, there is more. Do you want more? Do you want to walk closer to God? Do you want to see more of God? Do you want to believe more of God? How far are you willing to take your faith? And so out of this situation now, God does some amazing things. Forty years of spiritual defeat and failure have been rolled away. It was the dawn of a new beginning in a new land. The days of sullen refusal to respond to God under Moses were now in the past. Complaining was ended and hopeless wandering we're now over. You see, now we have a people that have a powerful sense of destiny and purpose. The old generation that was full of the negativity and the victimhood and the slavery mentality had to die off and get out of the way for the new generation to be able to step in to what God had wanted the previous generation to have but they had rejected it. You see, this is the problem when one generation does not step into what God has for them, the generation that follows them can often lose their faith. You see, the Bible tells us in the book of Judges, chapter 2, and verse 10, that after the generation of Joshua died, that the next generation that grew up did not know the God of Joshua, neither had they seen the things of God. Here's a whole, gen just one generation removed, and that generation knew not God, and they knew not the miracles. That's why God said, set up this memorial stone. Why? Because God knows that we are prone to forget. We are prone to move away from God. That's our natural bent. Our natural bent is to move away from God. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Oh, here's my heart, the songwriter said. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And so a whole generation passes off, and when they pass off, their faith passes off with it. And so these people now had a sense of purpose. The previous generation could not receive the purposes of God because they could not get over their past. They were constantly victims of their past. You see, are you going to allow your past to rob you of your future? Or are you going to be able to believe God and step through that impossible situation 
and watch God do a miracle on your behalf, believing that he can and believing that he wants to show himself strong and mighty on your behalf. You see, the believer today should be able to look to God and see that God is changing our directions and giving us a new hope and a new sense of purpose. A time when we, by faith, abandon ourselves to God, step out into our destiny, and take new territory for him. If we're not careful, we can look at the completion of a new building over here, and we can say, now we can just rest. We've done it. Praise God. Now we're just going to rest. And that has its own inherent dangers. We need to just believe God for even greater things. Now for this, most of this year, we have preached to an auditorium that is on a good Sunday, a third of the way full. I want to tell you, for a pastor, that's hard. You know, I've seen enough of the Wood family. Just too much wood. I want to see people. You see, I believe this year we need to see God rescuing people, God delivering people, God healing people, God saving people, and bringing people under the sound of the gospel. I believe it's a year for victory, not of defeat. We've come through a year of wilderness wandering. I'm ready to cross into the new land. I'm ready to see God do some amazing things. How about you? Are you willing to go too? Are you willing to step out on faith? This is what God is telling us. So the monument that was built with these 12 stones was to serve as a visible reminder of the faithfulness of God. It would be a silent monument to the special day on which the people of God stepped into impossible situations, a flooded river, and yet confident that God would see them safely to the other side. This monument was a pillar of testimony to the miracle power of God bringing deliverance. And it would be a testimony to the people around them. It would be a testimony to their children and their children's children. Let me tell you something. How many of you have a testimony? Do you have a testimony? Did you know that your testimony is a powerful testimony? weapon and it's what makes you dangerous to the kingdom of darkness it makes you a threat to the enemy why because your testimony is real to you and it cannot be taken away and it has the power to affect those who hear it you see it's not what you came through that makes you a threat. It's the fact that you came through. And so here's the thing I want to ask you. Do you have a testimony? You see, you need to tell it because that's what makes you dangerous to the kingdom of darkness. That's what makes you a threat to the enemy is the fact that you have a testimony of how God brought you through. And when God has brought you through, tell it because other people need to come through too. They may argue with Scripture, but when you tell them, listen, I was in darkness, now I'm in light. I was broken, but now I'm healed. I was in bondage, but now I'm free. I was hopeless and now I'm filled with hope. Listen, they can't argue with that because it's your testimony that God has given you. Use it. Use it. Your personal victory benefits no one until 
you declare the faithfulness of God and the mercy that God used to deliver you, to restore you, to set you free. It's then your testimony that becomes a weapon. It's like a sword in your hand, an instrument of power. The Bible says in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So tell it, because the power of life is in your tongue. Speak it forth. Speak forth the word of God. It has life-giving power. So speak it. So your testimony becomes a lifeline to someone who's sinking. And God will give you a testimony, but as you go through your impossibility, you must remember that there is no miracle without a problem. There is no victory without a battle. There is no crown without a cross. There is no resurrection without a death. And there is no testimony without a test. So if you're going through something now, thank God. Because God is going to give you a testimony. And he's going to show you his power to deliver. And you will see the miracle of God working to open doors that have been closed and closing doors that have been opened and you are going to have a powerful word that God will use in the days to come. You see, God knew that their faith would be severely tested in the days to come, and they needed to come back to this pile of rocks that was taken from an impossible situation that God turned into a memorial of his faithfulness, and they needed to come back and remember God is faithful. And that's why each year I come to this time and I share this story because I want you to look at your rock and I want you to say, this is that hard thing in my life. This is that impossible situation in my life. This is what's breaking my heart today. This is what I face today. And it hurts, and it may be dark, and it may be trying to just overwhelm and swallow you. And that's why I want you to just write on there. Whatever it is, it may be physical, maybe a health issue. You just write health on there. It may be financial difficulties. You just put a dollar sign on there. It may be a son or a daughter who is away from God. Just write their name on there or their initials. It might be your own spiritual life. You're tired of living subpar. You're tired of not seeing God. You're tired of not hearing God do something for you because you're heard him do something for others and you're saying I want God to do something for me put a cross on there whatever you need to do if you need deliverance because you're in bondage to something then write that on there just write the word deliverance listen folks and then set this thing up in your windowsill, by your bedstand, on your desk, maybe carry it in your pocket. And every time you see it, you pray. And you believe God. And then you watch God turn this impossible situation into a stone of praise when he answers, when he comes through. And then the next time you see it after he's answered, it is now a memorial stone of the goodness of God. God can deliver. How many of you really at your core, you believe that God can deliver in any situation you're facing? You believe that? 
Until you really believe that, you might as well throw this away. Don't throw it at me, but just throw it away. Why? It'll do you no good. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. I've said that so many times, Hebrews 11, 6, and you're going to hear me say it a lot more times. If you believe that God is the God of the impossible, then write it on there and pray. Make it a daily prayer reminder. So in passing through the waters, the Israelites were dying to their old life, and now they were receiving new life from God. There's that identification again. Joshua had his own memorial that he built in that river. No longer a runaway slave from Egypt. You see, Joshua saying, I've died in this river. My old life is dead in this river. I'm coming out on the other side. And those stones that he put up there were like a tombstone. It kind of represented his death to the old life. And now he comes over to Gilgal, and there is new life. It's kind of interesting. The word Gilgal, what does the word Gilgal mean? It means to remove or to roll away. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You see, as long as they were wandering around with no land in the wilderness, they were a reproach to all the nations. They were saying God could bring them out, but he cannot bring them in. God cannot take his people anywhere. It was a reproach. Their own sin had kept them from moving into their destiny. It was a reproach. You see, their sin was on them, and they could not get it away and the nations just simply wondered at them what are these crazy people doing in the wilderness has God given them the wilderness and here's the thing I want us to understand is that Gilgal is a place for each of us that we all need to come to Gilgal, and for us, it's called Calvary. Because it's at Calvary that our sins are rolled away. It's at Cal Calvary we have a new life, a new beginning. It's at Calvary the condemnation of our sin is removed. Our personal Gilgal is when we come to the foot of the cross and we say, God, cleanse me. Forgive me. Save me. I want you to be my Lord. And so crossing the Jordan is not, as we often think of, you know, the land of Canaan being heaven and crossing the Jordan is when we die and go into heaven. That's not the imagery here. The imagery here is that crossing the Jordan, this new place, was not a picture of salvation. It was a picture of separation. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 29, he says there is rest. And he talks about this rest. And when he talks about this rest, he says, Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That's verse 28. Verse 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. He's talking about two different kinds of rest. Verse 28 is the rest of salvation, because I no longer have the burden of trying to save myself. 
I am at rest in Jesus for what he did for me at Calvary. I no longer have to strive to earn heaven. That's the first rest. But Jesus goes on in verse 29, he talks about another rest, but he says this rest comes as you take my yoke upon you. He's not talking about earning salvation. He's talking about victory. He's talking about the rest of victory. As you serve him, you serve him not for victory, but because he has already won the victory. That's why his yoke is light. You see, Christ is our strength. And he says, now that you are saved, I want you to grow. Don't remain a baby. So he's saying here, there is the rest of salvation, that's free, not of works, lest any man should boast. But he also says there's the rest of victory. And victory requires us to get in the harness with him, serve him, and tell others about him. And we're already victorious. We're not doing it because we're wondering if it's going to work. Of course it's going to work. That's why it's called rest. If you already, listen, if I was going to take a final exam and I already knew before I took it that the teacher said, you're going to pass, I'm going to give you an A on it, but go ahead and take it anyway, would my soul be all in stress and distress? I'd come into that classroom, what? As a matter of fact, the night before, I would probably get a good night's rest. Why? Because I already know I've passed. As a child of God and you serve him, you already know that it's going to work, that it's going to be blessed, that God's going to use you, that people are going to be helped. You don't have to worry about it. It will happen. Victory is yours. So, let me close with this. The stones of victory, were they on the former side or the promised land side? They were on the promised land side. The thing I want us to know is this, that restoration, victory, salvation, None of that ever happens without repentance. Without repentance. I don't know if you're here today and you're thinking, man, I am so tired of carrying this burden on my soul. I am so tired of living this life. I am so tired of all this garbage. Here's the promise, folks. It's time for a new beginning. And Christ says you can have that, but it starts with repentance. What's repentance? Repentance is when you agree with God that you cannot save yourself and that you need a Savior and only He can wash you away sins away. Only he. I can't. The church can't. Baptism can't. None of that can. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the what? Blood of Jesus. So come to him. Come to him. And when you do, through repentance, you're going to find everything you've been hoping for, longing for, needing to fill that hole in your heart will be met in no one who ever called upon the name of the Lord was ever put to shame. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that these stones represent deliverance. Thank you that the very fact that they were on the other side of the Jordan indicates victory. Here we are at Gilgal. Our sins are rolled away. The 
reproach and the failures of the wilderness are behind us. And now we're in a new land. Lord, we have you before us. We have you behind us. We have you on our right side. We have you on our left side. Father, we have you above us and underneath us are those great big everlasting arms of yours. We have your spirit within us. So, Father God, we are surrounded, protected, and loved. For those, dear Father, who don't know that, boy, today would be a perfect time, a great day, for them to understand that today is a day of new beginnings. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen.